there. Welcome to lesson one. Before I go into demonstrating and showing, I want to shortly go over the reasons why I do this tutorial. Uh, I wanted to do it for a long time, of course, but the reason why I, that got me started now is a couple of weeks back I saw a nice, well, actually not so nice, a street fight. And first of all, it looked like the usual things. Two guys just bumping into each other. You'll know the stuff. <laughs> Posturing, bump, go away, hop around, bump, go away. And suddenly one got in on the other, struck him down, and the other went to the floor. So far, everything was fine. Did you notice these in my hands? Right, neither did I. The guy who went to the ground had a knife in his hand. Now, I'm knowledgeable about the martial arts to a certain degree. I was watching from roughly five to seven meters away, checking that my family didn't get hurt. And I swear I only saw the knife when the un one guy already was down, had it in his right hand, hand covered in the red fluid, probably blood. I did not see the knife while the bumping was going on. And this is the main reason why I started or accelerated the starting of the tutorial, because the question is, what if my attacker is armed? What if my attacker is not armed? The point is, that is not a question. We must always assume the attacker is armed, because you just can't see it. Because when the street fight that I observed happened, it was the bright light of the day, so there was no excuse about visibility was bad. It was noon. It was a street in the right part of the town. It was a busy shopping street. Lots of witnesses around. It erupted out of nowhere. I don't know what it was about. I don't know any of the dudes. And uh, it dissolved into nowhere, like these things happened before the police could arrive. But the point was, I didn't see the knives. Now, you may see these one. Where I live, they are sold at belt knives. You can have them in the belt buckle. You have them like this in your hand. And this might be a box cutter. So, there are essentially three possible grips that you could have. The so-called hammer grip. If the wrist is tilted, some call it the saber grip. But let's keep things simple. So we have the hammer grip. Swinging like a hammer. You can do stabs, slashes all around. You could have the ice pick grip, the same thing, stabs, slashes, and you could have this in the middle or in the fist grip. See? You can do the same stuff, stabs, slashes, all that kind of stuff. And these are not big. However, the Chinese proverb is the blade need not be big, only sharp. This is more than enough to cause severe grief, bodily harm, or even death. So now the point is, this reflects back on how we should train. And the thing I really want to get across, there is one way of parrying in boxing, come, slowly please, where the boxer catches the incoming. Now, this is good for sports. It is potentially suicide for a street situation. Because if my wife had so, this little beauty in her hand and I caught it like a boxer, you know what's going to happen. In a street fight, normally the one who gets the first step in wins. Not always, but who wants to train in a way that jeopardizes him. So, one of the things I want to stress is we can only take any incoming here on the wrist or elbow on the forearm, which is actually even better because this is pretty small area to hit and very hazardous as we have seen. So we always want to have to get it here or here. Now that has another consequence for training. These are magic markers. I more often than not practice with my magic markers like this. I will hold this in the camera so you see it. I always have them in the same side so that I can have valuable feedback. So red is thumb side, blue is pinky side, 
and green is where the <coughs> beg your pardon green is the fist side so now So now, when I do, for instance, the passing drill, which we are yet far away from doing, but this is just to show what, and give a motivation of why I do what I do, then I can see, let us see, oh, right now I got myself painted green, and I know exactly from the color what painted me. So I can use this to get a very good feedback. I know practicing with magic markers is not very much liked in the martial arts community, but uh, if you really want to practice for self-defense, you need three of these, or at least one of these. Three is better, because you never know where the knife will be. And you just cannot tell where, if there is a knife at all or not, and if so, in what grip it is. Like I said, we had bright light of the day. I watched the fight from a distance, and my adrenaline wasn't going. I was just at the ready to protect my family, in case suddenly one of them goes haywire and changes the target but they were pretty much stuck together. And I didn't see the knife until things were over. Now, if I don't see the knife from the outside, as a experienced observer of these things, then, and bright light of the day, it was as bright as now. So, chances are we will not see the knife. Maybe, if we are very street savvy, if we know in what part of town we are and we are looking around, we can, of course, perhaps see trouble develop and deploy whatever means of our own we have. But that is a maybe. So our training should focus on being able to handle an incoming with bare hands to buy us the time to maybe then deploy a weapon of our own. That being said, the reason why I train the way I do has much to do with the knife. And now, Let's start uh, with a little bit more of demonstrating. Please give me a straight punch. Got it. And what you do, see me do here is I go in with a very violent slap because I want this to be away of me as much as possible. And this is, if I would do, if I knew for sure that she was unarmed, I might go in rather straight with this arm very straight, having my second control arm here and going here, just waltzing over her. But since I can never ever assume, armed or unarmed, I want, upon first impact, this is really my first entry, I want this thing to point away from me as far as possible. Now, how, how do I do that? If I, first of all, there is, as you see, I turn my body. I will go into body contortion and footwork more when I have a camera person. Again, today we are filming from the tripod, but basically right now what I'm applying is not much more than swinging my body left to right. And the other thing that I imply is if I practice this slap on the dry, I rather violently slap my opposite shoulder. So upon the first incoming, you really slap in violently. And if you go through a lot of repetitions, you might perhaps want to wear something on the arm because uh, if I would slap violently like this on my wife's arm she would probably stop training with me and tell me that I should go to look for another rough guy. So if you really go for lots of repetitions maybe you want to wear some padding because actually this is as violent as possible. And you turn out. The other point is why do I use this because quite frankly this is one of the fastest movements we can have. And when we talk blade, we want to have speed, especially upon the first entry. Uh, also, everybody swats flies like this. This is very instinctive. So nobody swats flies like this, if we can help it. I mean, the other instinctive movement is if something comes in, we go into the embryo. And everybody who knows about Silat or Casey fighting method will remember this. So, those are the two instinctive movements we have at our disposal. And rather than retrain our instincts to become something else, I advocate to uh, take the instincts we have and re-educate them and build on them 
instead of bending them away. So, the first thing if you want to incorporate Hubbard is before you actually go into the whole flowing drill thing, you must uh, go into the entry. And I, now, the second point is why we have the entries that we have. Our, if we do Hubbard, our happy place is out here. In other words, if you can see, this fist is exactly trailed on my wife, this fist is trailed on my wife, this knee, I don't know if one can see this, but this knee is trailed on my wife, this knee is trailed on my wife. In other words, all my four guns, China Boxer always says this, our big and small guns, our, all my guns are trailed on her, none of her guns are trailed on me. So this is clearly a happy place to be. When we are talking unarmed self-defense, in other words, she is unarmed, I could be here or I could be here, doesn't matter. I could go into all kinds of arm bars, figure four locks and stuff. When we are talking about armed self-defense, I want to restrict her mobility as much as possible. So I would prefer to have control of the elbow because here she has one elbow, one, her shoulder joint is still free to move. I don't have control about this. If maybe I just have her here, she has two joints, which gives her lots of freedom. And quite frankly, if it is a determined opponent who wants to do me bodily harm, he or she will wiggle out of this rather fast. And I don't want her to wiggle out of this in that vicinity of my face. Just imagine this. She wiggles out. That's no good. So this is better. And if I have to have it, I will take it here. There she can still do some wiggling, but I have much better control. However, if I can help it, I want elbow control because the mobility she has here is no good and I have a direct access to her center. I can directly attack her center of gravity. Here, there is one joint, her shoulder joint, between me and her center of gravity. So my absolute happy place is here. From here, I can wreak havoc. I can start pounding on her triceps until her arm goes dead. And if she dances around and tries to wiggle out, as you can see, I can still stay on her back, do lots of pounding, always have control, and go into all kinds of locks from here. But that is very violent, way ahead in the future. We have lots of ground to cover before we enter there. So this is just the motivation of why I do what I do. So my ultimate happy place is here. Elbow control, shoulder control. If I have to, wrist control and elbow control. Some end up here, but this actually, if she knows what she is doing, she could support this and make a violent step in my direction. And I am eating an elbow. So that's not so preferable. It may happen and we need to know what to do with it. We'll cover that later. But for now, the recommended happy place is this. Elbow, shoulder, and uh, wrist, elbow. Those are the two happy places we are in. Me facing her, she, if possible, facing 90 degrees away from me. And that is the first prime objective of Hubad Lubad. Now, let us start, give me a hammer, intercept with a wedge entry, go with a cut and shave, take elbow control and lead her away, go here with a check, a control, pin it to the body and go into the drill. If she defends, she has to learn the body contortion to get out of this and so forth. Now, there are critic points that say this is a lot of passive movements. So for instance, passive movement, passive movement, passive movement, and finally, I'm going to get my shot in. What's to be said about this? Actually, come give me a hammer again. I could go in like this with one tact, uh, with one count. Or I could even just go in like this, cut her short and hit her. Again, that would be okay if we are talking unarmed combat. And the second, when she comes in with a knife, please give me a hammer again. And I come in like this. Maybe I knock her out, maybe I don't. If I don't, then this is a stupid thing to do. Okay, then you say, 
take her from outside again. So I do this. If I get away with it, okay. Maybe I knock her out. Maybe I don't. Just look. Then I have it here. She can cut me here. Or even, let's presume, I bang her away and really get her. And she is really knocked out. But I have seen many guys who are knocked out and still cling to the knife. The guy in the street altercation a few weeks back had glazed eyes over, didn't really register anything that was going on around him after he was knocked to the ground, but he was clutching the knife. So even if she is already unconscious and that thing is just going flailing wildly, it is still a very sharp object. So I don't want that to happen. So in other words, I need to have contact with what wields the weapon. We still aim for the center. We want to decommission the guy or the girl and not the knife because it is not knives that kill us but people that kill us. So I still want to take her out of commission but I simply cannot afford to go in just relying only on an intercepting fist, not once we introduce knives in the equation. Uh, also, there is the saying, that a half step back and come forward to me with a step, that I may use stop kicks and stuff. That is okay if she brandishes the knife, I see the knife and she comes from a distance. However, if we are already that close and only now I happen to see the knife and I didn't get the stop kick in, then I got to take it from there. And uh, in other words, no, not in other words. And all those flow drills, the Hubert Lubart flow drills and the others that I simply adopted for the sake, serve actually one purpose. The purpose is to make some contact now we have a bridge, right? We did bridge the gap. To, serve, to bridge the gap and then walk along the bridge until I can reach her center. <sighs> to walk along the bridge, control the bridge, because the bridge is brandishing, potentially brandishing a dangerous weapon. And I don't want to have to care if she carries a weapon or not. Because my premise is I will never know when something starts. I cannot really reliably know if the guy is armed or not. I can't. So, I must use any incoming the way it comes and walk the bridge until I get to a knockout point or to a point where I can control her center of gravity. Tai Chi does this. You know, remember Tai Chi is an old man's art. If she comes in, we may be practicing. This is, this is probably what you would recognize from Tai Chi. This is all stuff that allows you to develop sticky energy and to walk the bridge. The Chinese arts are actually walking the bridge. Another reason, also China Box speaks about this, if I'm young and fast, come in again, I may be getting away with uh, the intercepting fist. If I'm older and she is younger, faster, stronger and bigger, so imagine for a second that she is bigger than me, coming in and I don't quite make it, because she is younger. I cannot rely on the intercepting fist alone, because I may be older. So I want to establish a bridge and make sure that there is no gambling involved. China Boxer speaks about gambling in combat and how to avoid it, and vampire, China Boxer, vampire, uh, they both say and rightfully so, and are of my opinion, that gambling in combat is potentially a threat to our lives. So we want to establish a bridge, no matter how, walk the bridge until we can get a knockout in. Now, and this is the specialty of the southeastern arts, no matter whether they come from the Philippines, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, no matter if you call them Arnis, Eskrima, Kali, Silat, while we walk the bridge, the bridge itself becomes a viable target. In other words, there is lots of limb destruction going on. So, I'm not just from this position going in for the knockout. I may clip the arm and in the back swing whip it out to have my wrist here bang against the head. This is another thing I want to briefly talk about. 
I prefer using the palm or the wrist because both of them don't need conditioning. For instance, if I taught my wife how to do a decent bunch with a fist, I could teach her the technique in one afternoon. And then she would have to bang the wall, wall bag with iron palm stuff and condition her fist for at least a year before she could actually apply it. Because the good advice only hit the soft spots doesn't necessarily work because if things are chaotic I hit and whatever I hit is where I make the impact. And if her fist makes impact on a steel forehead, probably she gets a broken hand and uh, the other guy doesn't feel a thing. Whereas if she knows how to do to exert power with her palm, she doesn't need any condition. Maybe if she hits a steel head with her palm. It also hurts like hell, but it doesn't get her injured. The same is true for the wrist punches. So, again, an in hammer, please. I may have this clip the elbow in the back swing, bang her, get this, go into a control. I have an elbow here. So, that's the kind of stuff we are aiming for. But we don't want to have a chance result. We don't want to gamble to get it. So what we want is, we want to systematically get it in. And that is where the Hubad Lubad and the Chi Sao and the push hands come in. Now as for Chi Sao, that is a Wing Chun technique. I said it in lesson zero. I am not remotely qualified enough to teach Wing Chun. Anybody who wants an online source to learn Wing Chun, go visit China Boxer's channel. That tutorial will offer you more than you could ever fathom in one afternoon. Sorry, this is I'm still stunned and speechless at what Jin does. But uh, anyway, I'm doing Filipino arts, and if you see my uh, profile, I have also logged some Tai Chi. Now, if we do the normal punch drill, come in. If I go slowly in, stop. What we have here is exactly the so-called three-point touch that we know from Tai Chi pushing hands. I'm not the first one who actually realized that the Hubad Lubad drills and the Tai Chi drills only differ in that Tai Chi is a little bit more close and personal and we are s sticking and not letting go of the contact. Whereas if I go a little bit away, it immediately starts to become the punch drill again. So the difference between Hubad Lubad and Tai Chi pushing hands is mainly the difference of distance. Huba Luba is roughly when our toes, you cannot see this, but roughly when our front feet are more or less on one line. If I make half a step forward, then what was Huba Luba suddenly is Tai Chi pushing hands, and we have the three point touch. And of course, every change of the lines that we had from the Huba Lubat can directly be applied in the pushing hands. Of course, we must have sticky energy, we must have good posture, and we must have what in Tai Chi is called Pang, bouncing energy, word of energy, because if I do that and I don't know what I'm doing, she is just watching over me. And so I got to have good posture and structure. I made a short clip about posture. I will go into this in detail later. So in a manner of speaking, I'm still babbling along to just show what's lying ahead. But I think that was it as for why I do what I do. I do what I do because people get older and they need a secure non-gambling way to get in. And uh, there are, you never know when a knife is at play <coughs> and when a knife is at play you want to avoid gambling at all costs. Since the usual street attack of a knifer probably occurs without much warning and from a close distance you will probably face something like this, which is almost an assassination attempt, and you will have to be able to deal with that. Like I said, if you are street savvy, if you're really into this kind of stuff, you'll probably recognize this going on beforehand. I saw the altercation from 10 meters away, and I could have stood clear. <laughs> I stood there and watched because I had to watch and make sure and shepherd my family around the whole thing. 
Otherwise, I would have just gone the other way and called the police from a distance or something, which several other witnesses did. Uh, but the point is, you cannot rely on being street savvy and paranoid enough to see the guy with a knife come at you before it happens. Maybe he's working up to you and that is all, that is all you get. Then you've got to be able to react to this. And pretty much instinctive. Come. Maybe this turn and this arm is all that is between me and severe bodily harm. And I've got to be able to take it from there because she is not going in real life to pose for me and stand like here for me to do my technique, as we all know. Because knife attacks probably come in like this and perhaps even holding me. I mean, the famous, infamous prison bum rush. That's the kind of stuff we have to deal with. So further down the road, we have to deal with wrestling techniques because if she is holding me and just holding me, this and now punching, this is an intimidation move that we know from the schoolyards, but this holding type of stuff means if she already got to hold my collar, there is wrestling stuff involved and I must deal with that. And again, I want to deal with that from the perspective of Hubert Lubert and push hands. Okay, now that was really enough talking. Let's see some action. Please give me a hammer. Right now, how we are standing is her right, I say this because the camera may not show it. Her right foot is in front and my right foot is in front. And uh, we are rather close. If she gives me a hammer, what you see is I'm turning away a little bit. So if I let go of my intercept for a moment, give me a hammer again, that is where her hammer would end up, right? When we are dealing, practicing with naked hands. Give me a hammer again. Now, I'm in here. Now, if I don't intercept, it's her upper arm that gets me. And we know the most danger of a punch is in here. So just by shifting my weight forward and turning, I already get out of the way. Now, if I lift this, uh, there is a barrier. That barrier is as much to block as it is to guide her along. Maybe if she is really, imagine for a second, stretch your imagination please, and imagine that she is King Kong and I am the little white woman. So I no way that I could block it. Then I take my structure and sh her energy is pressing me down and the whole thing is being guided above my head and I can come in. Uh, but the regular drill, we have this roof shape, see? If you see that from the side, this is the famous 70 degree angle. So here we have 90 degree, here we have 90 degree. And now, if she is pushing in on, on, no, no. If she is pushing in, but 90 degree, even though I'm stronger with her, if she really pushes, I can't stop that. Now, I push my arm out to a certain, push again. Certainly I will find an angle where she can no longer push my arm in. That's the angle we are looking for. That is roughly, taken from here, roughly 70 degree. Of course I could say if I completely stretch my arm and lock it out, she couldn't bend my arm either if she comes from the front. No way. But if I stretch my arm out and lock it out, I have no mobility left. Also, it makes my joints vulnerable to all kinds of attacks, so we don't want that. So we just want to go for the minimal angle that allows my arm to be uh, stable. If we do Tai Chi standing practice, that is exactly the angle we are in. And all kinds of stuff, look at my elbows. My elbows don't change angle. This angle is uh, almost magical. And we want, please give me an incoming, to turn out, have this 70 degree. We try to take it with our blade of our forearm because that gives us a lot of impact probability. I don't have to guess. I have all that part of her forearm to hit with all that part of my forearm. So somewhere I will make contact. From there, I will take the impact. I will have sensitivity, we go into this. And now, for the sake of the drill and for many other drills, uh, purposes, I do the cut. This is an undercut. This undercut can just be hands open with a check and a control. 
it can already be with a grip. I recommend we practice catching this in the tiger mouth so that we have the choice to either just check or grip. Again, we are always practicing with the possibility of a knife in our mind. So we want to get control over the incoming limb as fast as possible so that we can walk the bridge and do distraction to the body. There is a saying, don't chase the arms, chase the center. And that is still true. However, once a blade is entered into the equation, we cannot ignore the arms. We still walk the bridge to get to the throne room. Nah. We still walk the bridge to get to the other guy's center, but we must, we cannot just jump the, uh, the castle uh, ditch. We must walk the bridge and try to destroy the bridge. So I cannot stress this enough because there are so many people who say Hubert Lubert is useless because it is so many passive movements. And taken in for itself, if this were just naked hand, like I said, that is right. But this is a practice from where to build. So, we have this. The undercut, by the way, is done with the same shape of the arm. Going up here, we have that control, and I'm supporting her weight in a manner of speaking. Now I'm taking this away, leading her. Note, if I put that hand away, my other hand is now here, and I can just do the pin control and go in. Now, if on the other hand she does the return, she got to turn herself out. Now, block please. Come in again. Now, block it. And she got to learn what that is. See, I pinned her here. And her whole body, I don't know if the camera shows us, is turning out. So, would we also do? Come again. Stop. You see, she has pinned me here now. And if she, I wouldn't do anything, this would get at me. So now what I learn is to shift my weight and turn out of the control. So, this has many wrestling applications, so this is not passive at all. Because what I learned here, on the side of my trapped arm, while I'm intercepting here, is that I actually, while the arm is often pressed to my body, so I have no, much, I have no more leeway, what I learned here is to use my hip and my stance to get out of this. See, here she trapped me on my elbow, nothing I can do, but I can use her incoming energy and my own hips to just turn in us. Now I'm free. Now I can go up, do the undercut, the slap, and she does the same. She actually turns out. So we not only learn how to catch an incoming and get control, we also learn how to actually turn ourselves out of a trap, of a nasty trap, at pretty close distance. So there is more to this drill than meets the eye. And my wife clearly signals me that it is hot. We have been on it for a while. So uh, the lesson part, this is lesson one in a manner of speaking, basically motivating why we do what we do. And uh, of course, I want, don't want to betray you for this. So my wife is now going to paint me a little bit back. Coming in with a flailing motion. Wieder zurück. So, so, also immer so. Genau. You see, I got painted. Green, it was the pinky side. Again. See, this can be pretty lively. And there, blue. Uh, the belt knife got me. And she is becoming nasty. You see? Okay, stop. So, I've got some red paint here. It's actually paint and not a scratch. I've got green paint here. I've got two blue stabs here. And this was just while we were being nice and doing the demonstration, 
Uh, so you see how necessary it is to practice that kind of stuff. Uh, now this drill in and of itself is very important, but we cannot really use what we find in this drill if we don't have more sensitivity and flow drills around it. Uh, one sec, I will also show one last piece of bit of the hubbard. Also, I want to dispel the myth that the hubbard is made up of passive motions, because if you introduce sticks, for instance, give me a very slow hammer, please. Active motion, I bang her... Active motion, I bang her wrist again. Active motion, I bang her wrist. Last motion, the puño or the stick. Now, come in again. What do you think will happen if I bang her wrist here? She will probably drop the stick. Yet another attack. She will, the arm will probably be broken. The arm will be broken again. And this can... So, as soon as we in, enter weapons into the equation, the hubbard stops to be comprised of three passive movements and one active movement. Suddenly it becomes four active movements. And uh, since this was one of the drills around which the Mahapajit Empire did build the training for its soldiers, the drill sergeants probably face the same problem as they face today. Is there a drill that allows me to train my boys for the naked hand, for the blade and for the stick all in one? And the hubbard lends itself to it. So you have to learn only one shell of motions and you cover naked hand, blade and stick. I think that was it for today. We thank you for watching. We hope you have a great and nice day. And please look forward to my wife painting me all over in the future. Because logically it doesn't make any fun unless... Did I say that loud? Nah, crap. <laughs> Thanks for watching. So muss ich bisschen schneiden. Jetzt siehst du es da halt sofort. Beim unterm Aug. Aha. And as you can see, obviously I also seem to have some color under my eye in the face. So you see how necessary this practice and training with the magic marker is. I know people don't like it, but they don't like it because it shows them just what they cannot yet do. Practice with a magic marker is a great dispeller of magic illusions. Thanks for watching. Gotcha.